Thursday, May 2nd here on the Gist Baseball Show. You got Jack McMullen to my left, and I am Peter Apple. And all of this is brought to you by BetMGM. Jack, we have a lot of topics to go over today. Grayson Rodriguez unfortunately hit the IL. Byron Buxton left Wednesday's game limping. We got to talk about the impact that will make on the Minnesota Twins. Alec Manoa is back in the headlines. Why? We're going to tell you. Jose Abreu, unfortunately, was optioned to the For- Florida Complex League. Tommy Pham is having a great start to the year. You are going to give us a breakdown on Paul Skeens. And we have the top five pitches in Major League Baseball. This is a loaded show. I almost lost my breath just going through all the topics. So I'm going to tell you about game time in a moment. Can I ask? Yes. For the listener... Not the watcher on YouTube for the okay. listener. Am I still on your left for the listener? Oh, that's a good point because you are on my, this is my left hand. You are on my left. Yeah. And like the thing is YouTube, I may just spit out as like on your right and like she <laughs> could be wrong, but also audio, like, does it matter? You know what I mean? But you know, those weird, like sometimes I feel like Kanye did this once, but like sometimes an artist will have one track pop out the left side of your car and the other track pop out the right side of your car or like ear earbuds, kind of the same yeah, thing. I'm going to be completely honest. I don't think anybody listening to the show gives a lost? shit about our location. They want to they wanna hear about baseball talk. So okay. let them know where they should put their money in order to get some tickets to watch some well, baseball. The good news is it's not going to be much money if you use game time and we're going to help you save even more money, right? $20 off your first purchase when you sign up using the promo code Just Baseball. All caps, one word, J-U-S-T-B-A-S-E-B-A-L-L. All caps, just baseball, $20 off. Game time is now an official ticket mar- marketplace, an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball. That makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. I know you and Aram were recording at 4.03. As soon as this Zoom ends... You're going to get up and you're going to like Naruto run out of your apartment because you're going to go to the Mets game and you're going to see Shota and Jose Budo. And that's going to be so much fun for you guys. And I know that you purchased through the game time app. So um, you didn't wait for the last minute deal, but somebody's going to be in the building for cheaper than you guys because they wait for the flash sale and the last minute deal. And you have to be okay with that. Use game time, sports, concerts, theater, comedy, all that. And again, even if you're going to a, a like a concert, use the promo code Just Baseball for twenty dollars off your purchase. Terms apply. Game time makes ticket buying so damn easy. Use it. So this is something that I didn't know about Game Time. Uh, my girlfriend used it to buy some concert tickets, and you have to go to your profile, and then you click on the referral code. You don't just check out with your tickets and then the code is right there. You go to your profile on game time once you make your profile and put the promo code in there. Once you check out with your tickets, you'll see that $20 was taken off your first purchase. So if you're hitting a game this summer, I can guarantee that you are. Make sure to go to the profile on game time and use referral code just baseball. Jack, we got a lot to discuss, Mm -hmm. a ton to discuss. We're going to start off negative. We're going to go into some positive, then we're going to go a little bit negative again, and then we're going to go positive, and then we're going to end with the positive. Let's start negative. Unfortunately, Grayson Rodriguez hits the IL with a shoulder issue. At this point, he had a 371 ERA in 34 innings with 37 strikeouts and 12 punchies. Fastball velocity, 12 walks, excuse me. Yeah. The fastball velocity was a little bit down in his last start. Didn't look as electric and hasn't quite looked electric this season so far. He's had some good outings. Could this be a lingering shoulder issue that he's been dealing with? And the only reason I'm saying that, I know I see your reaction for all those on YouTube. I just expect a little bit more from him. So when I say that, that's what I mean by has it been lingering or did it just hit him in his last start? It's just it's so tough. Like it's probably been around for a couple of starts and he worked through it. It's hard to tell me that if G-Rod wasn't feeling right, you know, the day before, maybe even when he woke up, hell, maybe even in his pregame bullpen that he was going to say, no, I don't want to face the Yankees right now. Yeah. Like, he's going to face the Yankees. And he was really good. He started a shutout against... Yeah, they won. And I thought the point that Kevin Brown and Jim Palmer were making on the Orioles TV broadcast was excellent. He wasn't punching guys out. He he got punch outs when he needed to. 
but he was getting contact. Now, is that because he wasn't as gross as he typically was? Maybe. Is it also because he was pitching into the situation? Maybe. I'm not sure. The Ks weren't there like we typically see full go G-Rod crew. And that, you know, I guess is statistical cause for concern. The cause for concern kind of blindsided me, to be honest. I was just like, G-Rod looked, I thought, great against the Yankees on Monday night. And and now he's hitting the IL. Now, it, it's not a silver lining, but like what softens the blow a little bit is the corresponding move being John Means coming off the IL. Like John Huge. Means being there. That That's great. And Bradish is on a rehab too. Like he's building up. He'll get there eventually too. I'm just begging for the opportunity to see this O's rotation in its full form. And if we get a postseason of Corbin Burns, Grayson Rodriguez, Kyle Bradish, and Means, Kramer, like there's kind of a toss up for that four spot. But it's all good. Like, that's the thing. I just want to see the best version of the Baltimore Orioles because that is going to be a team that I enjoy more than most in the last however many years. 100%. I also, I just have a question of right now, what are the Orioles going to do with their current rotation? I know you kind of talked about it. Radish is coming back. We have means. But right now, we are looking at an Orioles rotation that is Corbin Burns, Paul Urban, now John Means, Dean Kramer, do you think they're going to have to pull up another minor league guy? Or are they going to go with openers? Because Bradish still isn't back yet. Grayson hits the shelf. And Tyler Wells is on the shelf as well. So with John Means coming up, that makes four pitchers right now in their rotation. Yep. Could it be a Cade Povich? Do they just go with openers from their bullpen? What do you think they do to slot it in in the meantime while we wait for Bradish? So I was going to say the answer is Cade Popich, who is a top 10 prospect in their organization. Um, he is not a top 100 prospect in all of baseball, but he's one of those guys that's probably in the 120 to 125 range. Povich is, I, I don't know how old he is off the top, 24 years old, a young 24. Lefty, think about like if somebody tried doing their best Max Fried impression, that's mm -hmm. Povich, where it's like... It, I have one question. Yeah. D.L. Hall comparison at all or not? No, even I don't think so. Because um, Hall the only is an electric only heater and change up. Like, Povich is more of a pitch mix guy. Yeah, the only reason I was bringing that up is War Memorial traded to the Brewers, lefty, curious, and you brought up Max Freed, lefties who throw pretty hard with a good breaking ball, which is curious if there's any comparisons there. Now, I'll, I'll give you the pitch mix here in a moment, and I'll give you like kind of the data from his last start, which came against Gwinnett. That was the 25th, so that was last Thursday, I want to say, maybe. Um, but Caden Povich this year with Norfolk. Five starts, 26 of the third inning, a 103 ERA. So mm. five starts, three earned runs in 26 in the third innings, punched out 40 in 26 in the third, walked 10. Opponents are hitting 116 against him. Povich has been nails and just running through the game log for Cade Povich. Six innings, one hit, no runs, no walks, five Ks. Five innings, two hits, one run, nine Ks. Five and a third, one hit, was a solo homer, two walks, 10 Ks. Five and a third, three hits, no runs. He scattered four walks, nine Ks. And then against Gwinnett, four and two thirds, three hits, one run, one walk, seven Ks. He has not been hit at all this year he's the answer right now and the reason i say max freed you know impression is skinny lefty wears the tight pants the delivery looks very similar where he gets closed quick and he moves quick um but man like ovich is the answer to fill that fifth spot right now it's really cool knowing that the orioles have a guy who you're out here comparing to Max Freed. Like, again, also not, not stuck by stuff. Like, I'm just No, saying. no, no. As a Yankee fan, now that's stuck in my head. It, it won't ever go away. That now, so they just brought up Max Freed. Whatever. The Orioles now have Max Freed, uh, according to Jack. That's, this we heard that live here on the Just Baseball Show. And the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and they have a full offense of prospects. Yeah, good for you, Orioles. No, I'm just kidding. You guys are awesome. So um, let me just one thing with the pitch mix real quick. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Because I've got it pulled up here. Cade Povich, he was a 2-1 loss for Norfolk. I don't know what's going on. Dylan Dodd, by the way, he's been actually solid. Cade Povich went 55% four-seam fastball. He sat 91, but for the most part, he's going to be 91-92. He's got a cutter, 
and he'll also throw a curveball. We'll also throw like a sweepy slider, and then we'll mix in the occasional changeup. So he really is a guy that likes turning the wrist and really snapping shit off, and it works from his delivery. So I want to talk about going back to Grayson real quick. Yeah. Uh, because Will Harris, um, at sandwich underscore pick on X, posted this graphic, and he was the one that originally brought this to light about the guys who have the highest four-seam velocity are all hitting the IL. So if we look at the top 10 in fastball velocity, you probably know the names. Bobby Miller, IL. Hunter Green, not on the IL. Sandy, IL. Yuri Perez, IL. Grayson, IL. Strider, Otani, McClanahan, Lazardo, Garrett Cole. That's the top 10 in fastball velocity from 2023. And only Hunter Green remains. When you hear that, what's your first reaction? Damn it. <laughs> My second reaction is exactly what Aram said when we talked about the elbow issue. There's a direct correlation between velocity and elbow issues. There it is. You're right. It's right there staring in front of us, right? We could talk about the pitch clock. We could talk about this. We could talk about that. There's the answer. When you were talking about Cade Povich is the clear answer as that five starter, this is equally the answer. Fastball velocity, elevated fastball velocity, leads to more injuries. That's why nine of the top 10 from 2023 are all on the IL. So more IL news. This happened today, actually a few hours ago. Byron Buxton left Wednesday's game, walked off the field after a stolen base attempt. The trainer came out and he walked slowly off with a limp. The Twins, at this point, were on a nine-game win streak, 66 runs in those nine games. But it was it didn't have a lot to do with Byron Buxton, but Byron Buxton still being in the lineup, especially defensively, that elite defense, incredibly impactful. Obviously, it's Byron Buxton. But to this point, 95 WRC plus, only one homer, one steal, and a 32.5% strikeout rate. We talked about Trout yesterday. It's just another day talking about another Buxton injury, but I hope he's okay. That's all the information that we have at this point is he walked off under his own power, looked like a hammy thing. Not ideal. Not ideal at all. So MLB, Fox, Fox Sports MLB, like FS1 was, was showcasing a game and they did a feature on Byron Buxton literally two days ago on April 29th. So that was Monday. The, they tweeted it out and the caption was, Byron Buxton is healthy and back in center field once again and he's ready to show everyone that he's still one of the best players in the game. It was a feature that they put together on him being healthy and available. He's, I mean, you have to write it when he is healthy. He, you have yeah, to get it out. Like, but like, come on. Like him and Trout going down in the same 24-hour stretch is misery for baseball fans. This sucks. And like, I don't, I, I'm not going to sit here and say like, oh, this game sucks. This sport sucks because we're talking about velocity and, and how it, you know, kind of creates arm issues. And, and G-Rod was not an elbow. He was a shoulder. But like, man the best players in the game are just dropping. And the thing is, Trout, Trout's not a what if because he put together such a beautifully long prime. And like, shit, man, whenever he's on the field, I feel like he's still in his prime. And I, I know that he was only hitting 220, but he was leading the American League with 10 pumps. Trout's different because he already has 85 career war. We are being robbed in real time of one of the most immensely talented baseball players that we've seen in the last couple of decades. But we can't call him one of the best in the game. We can't call him one of the best at his position because the dude just can't stay on the field. And I, I don't want to frame this like an it like it's an indictment on Byron Buxton. So I'm sure this guy is doing as much preventative care as he possibly can. 100%. Look at his and, body. He looks like a freak of nature. He's not coming in all fat and that's sassy thing, and like, not paying was, attention. If there was a question about his work ethic, that's one thing. But like nope. the Twins might just have shitty luck with Royce Lewis, with Byron Buxton. Like Correa, I mean, Correa is still on the shelf. Correa, man. Like, it, it is, it's so hard for me to not feel horrible for Royce, for Buxton, for Correa, for the Twins. Because I know those guys are all three specimens, but man, like they're sports cars. It feels like they hit a pebble 
and they're in the shot. 100%. At least Yohan Duran is back, which is huge for the Twins. Yeah, and they, gross. yeah. While we've been speaking, they did just come back against the White Sox. So it might be 10 Were they not going so there to? Is a, come on. I don't know. <laughs> but there is a bright side here, is what I'm trying to say for the Twins fans. Obviously, this is bad news, but Twins fans are used to this news by now. I'm sure all of them are just saying it's a matter of if, not when, or a matter of when, not if. And, and again, man, like, they've won nine in a row. They're on, they're yeah. on the cusp of winning 10 in a row. Like, hey, vibes could be way better in Minnesota if Byron Buxton didn't limp off trying to steal a base. And they've been doing all this. Buxton now limps off. Correa has not been in the lineup. Royce Lewis has not been in the lineup. Kepler returned a few, I think it was about a week ago. Twins offense is hitting, like I said, 66 runs scored in that over that nine game win streak. And they have five right now and we're sitting in the top of the seventh. So add another five to that 66 total. That's 71 runs. Brooks Lee hasn't even started in St. Paul yet. Big. Do you think he makes the bigs this year? If he's healthy. No, well, even if he is, even if he is, do you think he's, you think he's good enough to be on a big league roster right now? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Is anything else to add? Anything else to add? No, that's it. I, I okay. feel like he is good enough to debut this year. Let's talk about Alec Manoa. Yeah. See if he's good enough to debut this year. I, I sent you the the list of all the topics, and you said add Alec Manoa. Why add Alec Manoa? Is he looked as good as he has since he was third in Cy Young voting in 2022? Mm. Mm. That was fun. And I... Woke up on Tuesday morning. I was like, oh, this is fun. Like, we're the MLB free game of the day. Like, it's Skeens versus Manoa. And the narrative around those two was just so different. It was like the the guy that dreams of being the perennial all-star just getting going in his pro career. And is this the last start he makes in AAA? Spoiler alert, I have no idea. Um, Alec Manoa, meanwhile, is like, his 30-day rehab window for this shoulder thing is up next Monday. Like, is he going to get options? He was really not good. He came in with a nine ERA. And Alec Manoa goes six innings, two hits, one run was a solo homer from Nick Gonzalez, who has looked amazing so far this year. 12 Ks. Mm. His slider was, he made Yasmani Grandal look stupid a couple of ABs in a row. Like it was five consecutive sliders low and inside that were so gross. And Grandal was swinging over the top all five in a row. And then Grandal laid off the sixth, so he pumped 94 at his knees and locked him up, and that was it. He was 93 to 94, grabbed 95 occasionally with that sinking fastball. And that slider was as sharp as it's been since he was considered one of the best young pitchers in the game. I'm not saying that that 22 Alec Manoa is back, but as of right now, that 23 Alec Manoa could be the blip in the radar instead of the 22 Alec Manoa being the blip in the radar. I want to see him back to back. I'll see him throw again on Sunday. So like, I'll give you a detailed report. The last time we talked about Alec Manoa, we both agreed. We have now turned into Alec Manoa supporters. Like I think, or maybe it was just me, but at the beginning, you know, pressure builds diamonds or whatever the hell he was saying. He was talking a lot of shit and then, you know, has a really bad season. And there was a part of me who was like, yeah, hell yeah. But now I've done a full 180 and now I'm rooting for him because he is better for the game of baseball. Like when Alec Manoa is good, baseball is better. We talk about that with a lot of players. Headline, so I, man. I want him to make a return. And the reason I bring him up and talking about the return to the big leagues, Yariel Rodriguez just hit the IL with a back issue. Now he was filling in as the five starter for the Blue Jays. They still have Bowden Francis. He just hit the shelf, apparently, too. Exactly. Is it now time for Alec Manoa? I think they want to see back-to-back good outings. But again, his 30-day rehab window is up on Monday. He's scheduled to start on Sunday. Him and Skeens again on Sunday wow. afternoon, um, which will be fun. I'm sure it'll be the free game of the day. So like, just tune into that one if you want. Um, they probably want to see back to back. He threw, I think, 92 pitches in six. They probably want to see back to back, you know, 90 plus pitches um, success. Uh, the short term answer at this point was I think Zach Pop was the corresponding move. So it was Pop up Rodriguez on the shelf. 
you won't see Manoa make a start next turn through, I don't think, but he might have changed the narrative. Like, he might not be a Buffalo Bison. He might not deal with his second option. You know what I mean? I'm just saying if they need a spot start, why well, but don't, Manoa right now. I don't think they throw Manoa off of what they need to see from him. I think they would rather bullpen it for a day than just be like, hey, you know what? You're ready. Let's do it. You know what I mean? No, I do know what you mean. Another player that you already mentioned, who we can kind of skip to now because they faced each other. So while it's fresh on your mind, let's talk about Paul Skeens for a second. Because Paul Skeens has been truly the definition of dominant. 0 3 9 ERA in 23 innings. He's only allowed 14 hits, one earned run, 41 strikeouts, six walks. My question for you, Jack, is Paul Skeens the best minor league pitcher you've ever seen? <laughs> I just had this conversation on the call up literally 45 minutes ago. I want to hear it now. Said, yeah. Yes. Paul Skeens is the best minor league pitcher that I've ever seen. He is the most dominant pitcher that I have ever been able to watch that is not at the major league level. And I'm talking like, I, DeGrom has obviously unlocked a, a new level of dominance during his peaks, right? Um, Kershaw went through crazy dominant stretches. You know who went through crazy dominant stretches was Zach Granke. Like, one of my first memories of pure pitching dominance was Granke in Kansas City. It's like, oh my gosh, look at this guy. But dude, I'm I'm even going to like... <laughs> College baseball, like I, I, Strasburg at San Diego State, I really wasn't a college baseball head at that point, so I didn't get to watch it. The fact that he's been billed as the best amateur pitching prospect since Steven Strasburg, and I, you know, that was kind of like the edge of me really diving in and paying attention to baseball full time. Like I didn't watch his minor league starts, but in terms of the runs that I have seen minor league starters go on, even since post COVID, let's call it post COVID. Grayson Rodriguez in 2021, Andy Painter in 2022. I, I mean, even a guy like Joe last year. There's just nothing like Skeens. And I think it's the way he's doing it. He's sitting 100 every time he's out there. And the point that I made to Aram was the one thing that I've heard that Skeens needs to work on other than building up other than increasing pitch count. Derek Sheldon had media availability. He talked about it, the pirate skipper. And he said he needs to be more efficient. And again, like I'm paraphrasing. I said the same thing on the call-up. He needs to be more efficient after he threw 61 pitches in three and a third at home against St. Paul, I want to say. He got through six innings in 75 pitches. Mm -hmm. They ask him to do something, and he does it. And he fucking kills you while he does it. He's going to be a great pitcher for a very long time. And every time I've gotten to watch him, I'm reminded why we get into baseball and like why we get into baseball coverage. Like he reminds me why I love calling baseball games. Because like they're mm. long games. They're three hour, 15 minute games. And it's like, ugh, gross, like bad defense. You know, Buffalo made three errors in the same inning today. I'm just like, oh, God. But then I get to watch Skeens throw, and I'm like, oh, shit, that's right. This is the best thing ever, and I'm really lucky right now. And, and that is really cool. And it's fun to be to have been around Skeens at this point, and uh, I think he's going to kill up there. I really do. That made me smile the entire time. Yeah, and like the thing is, I might, I might call another one of his starts on Sunday. I might call another one the following Friday. I've got no idea. I don't, I don't know how that's going to work. Um, but like whenever he does go up, if he's available in your fantasy league, go do that and like tune into this guy's start. Because again, it, it is the most anticipated pitching debut since Steven Strasburg. And I was locked in as a teenager on Steven Strasburg. How old were we when that happened? That We, we were like 15. Yeah, I remember. I think we were in high school. I'll, I'll pull up the year right now. Steven Strasburg. While you're doing that, while you're doing that, we I'm 12 years old. 12 wow. years old. I remember being locked in as a 12-year-old on Steven Strasburg. Like, I'm going to be locked in as a 26-year-old on, on Paul Skeets. Comparing him to Jared Jones, because Jared Jones comes up and electrifies the baseball world with tons of strikeouts, no walks, 99 at the top of the zone, routinely touching triple digits, which is a hammer over breaking ball. They're different pitchers. 
But Pirates fans saw the impact that he made initially. Can you just compare the two? The same, if not better? Like, in terms of impact, it'll be the same, if not I'm talking impact. about I'm talking about Jared Jones at the minor league level, the, the thoughts that you had watching him versus the thoughts that you have with Paul Skeens. And this is, again, I, yeah. you know, I don't want to put you in a corner, too, because I don't want you to ever talk down about Jared Jones no, no, when no. speaking about Paul Skeens. Just the comparisons when watching them. Yeah, I thought Jones was electric. And like there were times where I felt like he kind of got tired out at the end of at the end of his starts. And I, I'm sure he would say the same thing. And like there were days where he wasn't landing like he has been at the major league level. So I was just like, OK, yeah, like I see the electricity. I was pounding the pavement that Jared Jones is a top, you know, 50 prospect in baseball. And like we were the high guys on Jared Jones just based like arm adhered. And he slapped him in the top 50, if I'm not mistaken, it for sure top 60. But like that is who Jones was. But the difference between top 50 and arguably the best pay- pitching prospect in the game yeah, is like a, Jones was killing. But Jones, when he was killing, was like a low twos. Skeens is killing. And Skeens, when he's killing, is a .39 ERA. That's the difference. And Jones, like, it's fun. Jones was about 96, 97. He would grab nine last year. Now he's like sitting eight and he's grabbing 100, 101 in the first inning of his starts. There's a difference between sitting eight and sitting 100. And that's what Skeens is doing. God damn, I'm so hyped. <laughs> that just got me Raise so the Jolly Roger, man. I mean, it's a good time to catch Bucko fever at this point, man. That 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 whole segment, I'm just sitting here smiling, being like, oh my God, we're about to see it's him. Sick. It's sick. I dude, again, I don't know when you're about to see him, but like No, no, you just said you gave us a date. Thank you. Um you, and it, Max Freed is on the Orioles. No, I you're killing it so shit. far. Yeah, I, I'm just backing myself in the corners right now. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just trying to milk you dry of all the uh all the potential dates here. All right. Um pause. <laughs> yeah, pause. Back to bad news. Jose Abreu, your king, was optioned down to the Florida Complex League. He got off to just, I mean, the worst start maybe I've ever seen. Negative 1.5 B-War. He didn't play that much. 0.99 average. 156 OBP. 113 slugging. He didn't have a barrel the entire season. I mean, I know it's early. But a barrel, remember, a ball hit 95 miles an hour. Average launch angle between 18 to 32 degrees. He didn't have one. He has three RBIs. He has one extra base hit. He has a negative 20 OPS plus. And now he's a team guy, right? The Astros, I think they have a quote right here, and I'll read it. Um, my freaking internet is so slow with Fangrass. Fangrass <laughs> has just been destroying my computer. But I'm trying to find it here for, for everybody to read. While you have that load... Can right. I offer a weird quirk to you? Yeah, let me read it real quick. And then give me the weird quirk. So GM Dana Brown said it's get some ABs and get his timing back right. Yeah. And he's a team player. Like he's willing to do it. Joey Little Porfido, you guys already broke it down, but we didn't really talk about the fact that the 2020 American League MVP basically got the Alec Manoa treatment. We're bringing them up in the same episode. A major leaguer is not being sent down to AAA. This is a 37-year-old baseball player being sent to the Florida Complex League to get his timing back. We're not that far removed from his MVP. What was your reaction when you saw that? Um, my reaction was actually a weird quirk. And like, okay, I yeah, totally quirk. I immediately went to Google. Like, it was the quirk that I was going to share. Um, my reaction was, is this going to be the first time that Jose Abreu plays a minor league game? And the answer is yes. He was a 27-year-old rookie, and he's never been on a rehab assignment. He's been on the IL slash DL twice. Um, One was like a a week and a half stay, and the other was at the end of a season, and it was like, ah, you know, like we're all right. (laughs) So this is going to be his first minor league game (laughs) ever. So like he's got no minor league stats. He's not in the minor league database, which is very interesting. I was like, hmm, that's it. That's an interesting little quirk. The other thing is like, it's not an oh, how the mighty have fallen thing. It's really a feeling of insane empathy. Just mm-hmm. like you were the guy 
for the team that I grew up with. My favorite players on the White Sox were always pitchers. It was always Burley. It was always Sale, Quintana when he was hot too. But like a Brady was just always there. And, and there, there were a lot of people I knew that were like, oh, Abreu is one of my favorite players. He was never like the guy. Like my favorite player on those good White Sox teams was Tim Anderson. Mm. Like he was never my favorite, but he was always there and he was the leader. And he, like he was so good for all the Latin guys in that clubhouse, like Yoan Moncada. And note, as soon as Jose Abreu leaves, that place combusts. He was the glue for my favorite team growing up and watching him struggle. It's a lot like watching Derrick Rose go through those struggles when he left the Bulls. I'm just like, this this doesn't feel right. So for me as a Chicagoan, and I'm sure a lot of Chicagoans can relate, it just doesn't feel right seeing all this news from Abreu. Having said that, I get it. And I can understand the reasoning from Dana Brown. And I can understand the reasoning from Abreu. And this is such a professional move from Abreu saying, just go try and win. Like, we're not doing it. I'm a large part of that. Go try and win while I get right. I'm not going to like throw a grenade in this lineup and just be like, yeah, I'm going to figure this out up here. This isn't stubborn. This is leadership, frankly, if I've ever seen it in baseball. I'm totally gr- glad you brought up that point because a lot of people, the headliner is going to be $85 million contract getting sent down. I think you're totally right. I think they spoke with each other and Abreu said, you know what? I'm not right right now. We have Joey Loporfito in the minor leagues. Let me go down there. Let me figure out what this funk I'm in. My power has been decreasing year over the year over the past couple of years. Remember last year, I think he only had 15 home runs if I'm... You know, citing that statistic correctly, I think it was 15. And then this year, no power at all. It's one thing if he's striking out or the batting average isn't great, but he's always due to be a run producer. Three RBIs is just not Jose Abreu. One double all year is not Jose Abreu. So for him to, I, I don't want to call it, it's not waving the white flag. That's just not what it is. No. But what it is doing is is getting out in front of it and saying, I'm not right right now. I care more about us getting to October and me being a part of it. I can't get us there right now. Let me go work on my swing and then I will be back. I don't think we've seen the last of Jose Abreu. And I don't think we've seen the last of Alec Manoa either. I think just you get into a weird funk, you're aging like that. And if he gets it back right, he'll be back in the lineup soon. At least I hope. He looks older, does he not? Oh, yeah. Like, he looked older last year. So, you say, I don't think we've seen the last of Jose Abreu. I don't think we've seen the last of Jose Abreu, the big leaguer, either. I think we've seen the last of the 30 and 100 Jose Abreu. And that's what this guy was doing. Like, his 162-game average, even when you account for his time in Houston to this point, 284 with 30 homers and 108 driven in. And, like, the thing is, plays all the time too <laughs> like he's fully healthy at all times pretty much so you know you're getting close to 30 close to 100 that's what the astros thought they paid for but father time is undefeated and i i hope that father time hasn't ko'd him before we get to the top five pitches in major league baseball up to this point i wanted to do a quick shout out to tommy fam signed with the white Sox just about a week ago and he has been on an absolute tear to start the year. He's hitting 391 right now. He is nine for his first 23, and he hit a home run for the Chicago White Sox today. Of course, as we continue the show, now it's six to five. The White Sox are probably not going to get a win, but it ain't been Tommy Pham's fault. And Tommy Pham, you got to give the man credit. Doesn't get signed in the offseason. He's one of those, you know quote-unquote replacement-level players, at least in the eyes of some front offices, because he wasn't signed in the offseason. He wasn't that top young prospect, but he also wasn't that one of those veterans that they thought could impact the lineup enough to bring him in in spring training. So he joins the White Sox, is now on this tear, and this is from Cespedes Family Barbecue. Home runs with the most teams among active players. Tommy Pham at eight is the leader in the clubhouse. Carlos Santana, number two, Hunter Renfro at three, Brandon Drury at four, and Robbie Grossman at five. 
But Tommy Pham is just bouncing around, but he's always a professional, and he's killing it right now for a White Sox team who's in desperate need of bats. He's immediately right now the White Sox best hitter. I just wanted to shout him out, give him his flowers. You see the MVP? Yes. White Sox have a winning record with him. Just saying. If you want to do plus minus, like if we could do plus minus for baseball, Tommy Pham's plus minus per 162 through the freaking roof right now. Yeah, if we just end the season right now, best player in baseball. If the season ended today, it's my that's my favorite what if. If the season ended today, what would happen? All I'm going to say is Mookie Betts is in about 368. He ain't touching Tommy Pham's 391. That's Hell all no. I'm saying. No, Tommy Pham is officially on Williams' watch right now. <laughs> the top five pitches in Major League Baseball to this point. So on yesterday's episode, we did the best of April. But we didn't get into the nitty gritty. We did AL, NL, hitters and pitchers of the month and the top five teams. And I go over top five pitches a lot on the show because I'm always looking at what are the best pitches in Major League Baseball. So I wanted to bring the five to you. Do you want to guess or do you want me to just go through them? Uh, no, I'll guess. Shota's fastball. That will be on there. Yeah. Uh, can you give me pitch type? That's tough. So I've got want- like a blank canvas to work. It's a lot of four seam fastballs. A lot of four seamers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Has Javier been good enough with his heater to land him in the top five? Not on the top five. Okay. Um, shit, man. Bryce Miller's been really good. Not top five. Uh, thinking about four seamers. Let me just get into it. But first, remember, all the data we find is on Outlier. An outlier is a sports betting decision assistant for aspiring, intermediate, and advanced sports bettors who understand that data is the foundation of a profitable sports betting strategy. Outlier pairs hyper-contextual and relevant sports data with available betting markets. And unlike traditional sports data sites like ESPN and Baseball Reference, Outlier organizes and visualizes data for easy comprehension, efficient decision-making, and immediate execution. That's why we use it to find all of our data as well as make smarter bets. Make sure to check out its first of its kind strike zone heat maps and pitch arsenal roundups that allow you to quickly visualize pitcher and batter matchups all in one screen. It's available on iOS, desktop, and mobile browsers. Get your free seven-day trial at outlier.bet backslash just baseball. That's a free seven-day trial at outlier.bet backslash just baseball. You can find the link in the episode description, but then if you just download outlier when you're making your account, you'll see that promo code. Use code just baseball for seven free days. I highly recommend trying it. And these are the top five pitches so far by run value. And I love run value when looking at pitches because run value is defined as the run impact of an event based on the runners on base, outs, ball, and strike counts. So a 2 2 fastball with the bases loaded is going to be a more valuable pitch. These are basically the five most valuable pitches when it comes to run prevention. We can look at stuff plus grades, the physical characteristics of each pitch. I want to know which pitches are getting the job done the most. So it's not that cutter that that random reliever has that he's thrown seven times and got seven whiffs. No, these are high usage pitches, and that's why you're going to see a lot of four seamers. That cutter is sick, though. It is sick. That that cutter that that reliever threw seven times, so fire. It is. It got seven whiffs in my yes. made-up fantasy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and number five, Luis Castillo's four-seam fastball, which I was shocked to see on this list because it's down a full mile an hour from last year. Last year was 96.3. This year, 95.3. It's still spinning 2,200 RPMs, 203 batting average against, and he's throwing it 50% of the time. And here's a crazy stat. 345 times he's thrown this pitch. He's only allowed four extra base hits. And he has 26 strikeouts on that fastball alone. Luis Castillo, game on the line, goes to his four-seamer. And while it's a little bit down in velocity, it's still a top five pitch in Major League Baseball right now. Got you. Makes sense. Well, you uh, me to go to number four? Or you got yeah. Inside? Castillo, like Castillo, I've always thought change up. Like the best run value pitch of his is going to be change up. That's what I thought too. That's why I'm shocked to see it here. I like that it's not. And here's the thing like Castillo has been the one guy that got off to a slow start in that Rangers rotation or in that uh, Mariners rotation. 
I think Codify tweeted it out, and I don't have the tweet in front of me, but I, I think I have this right. Last 18 starts, Mariners starting rotation has allowed 18 earned runs. That's so hard to wrap my brain around. That's, that's just, they're doing this without Brian Wolf. <laughs> that's crazy. It's crazy. I'm pulling it up to make sure that I have it like absolutely right. Yeah, they did win the first runs, two games. 18 earned runs and 18 starts. Yeah, two of those starts were against the Braves. Shot them down in two games. Braves only scored three runs. And none of them have resulted in more than two runs against them. 18 consecutive games where a starting pitcher is not allowed more than two earned runs. A lot of them wear, wearing my Mariners hat for all those on YouTube. Shout out the, shout out the M's. Fire. All right, number four. You know this name. I'm surprised that you didn't go to it. And number four, Tyler Glass now of the Los Angeles Dodgers, his four-seam fastball. Talk about spin, 2,600 RPMs, averaging 96.3. That is just absurd. 2,600 RPMs on a fastball? No wonder opponents are hitting 187 against it. Only eight extra base hits. He's thrown it 357 times. It's a 56% usage on the pitch. Again, 26 strikeouts. He has a higher put-away rate than his breaking balls. And the cherry on top of the Sunday, a 35% hard hit rate against, which blows my mind because it's coming in so hot. We've seen with Jared Jones and with Spencer Schrider, these high-velocity four-seamers at the top of the zone can surrender some home runs, and it can allow some hard contact. But with Glass now, among pitches on this list, Softest contact allowed. That four-seamer is humming right now. Tons of extension coming right at you. If we ask hitters, does it look like 96? I guarantee you they think it looks like 101. High spin, long extension. Nobody's putting good wood on that pitch. All season so far. So I just went to Savant and I did the bubble thing with Glass now. And he is 100th percentile in fastball run value. He's 99th percentile at extension. I was like, who's extending more than Tyler Glass now? He's getting seven and a half feet of extension. Let me guess. Can I guess? There are two is, it Bailey o- is it Bailey Ober? No, it's not Ober. Uh, one is a reliever. One is a closer. Another is a starter. Is it Alexis Diaz? Alexis Diaz. Okay, so he gets more extension. He's like jumping forward. Him and Edwin <laughs> both like jump forward. It's sick. The other, it. guy, the other guy makes sense when I tell you. Starting pitcher. Joe Ryan? No. I feel like it's a twin. No, it's not a twin. Um, think about where you just put your right hand. Logan Gilbert? Logan Gilbert. Yeah. <laughs> just He's wearing a Mariners hat. hat. Yeah, like you put his hand on his hat. Mariners, Logan Gilbert. That was a good one. All right, number three. The guy traded for Tyler Glass now. Ryan Pepiot of the Tampa Bay Rays. His four-seat fastball. He's got not quite as much spin, not quite as much velocity, 94.7 miles an hour, 2,400 RPM, but an 074 batting average against, and he's thrown it 52% of the time. Jack, he's thrown it 277 times. How many hits do you think his fastball is allowed? I'll give you a hint. You can count it on one hand. I'll go five. I'll go high, high end. Yeah, you went high. It's four. <laughs> He's allowed four total hits against the fastball this year. He's punched out 23 guys on the fastball with a 41% whiff rate. That is the highest on this list. His four-seamer is dominating people. So opponents are hitting 074 against his four-seamer. They're four for 54 with 23 Ks, which like is crazy enough. Expect it, lowercase x. From there you go. Note it, write it down. In your notes app, wherever you keep all these. like, I just wrote it right in here. Right okay, in here. Gotcha. Yeah. Lowercase x, batting average. Opponents are expected to hit 114 against it so far. So it's not like it's fluky and he's just run into like hard contact. This is ridiculous. Also, might I say that opponents against his changeup are slugging 484. That was like his best pitch. Doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make it, but like, hey, welcome to the race. <laughs> he saw something with the heater and they were like, you know what? That's the guy we want. I was drunk on the Pepeo juice last year when he came up and was really good with the Dodgers a year ago because he slimmed down. He looked way more athletic. He looked way more in control. He just looked like a better athletic pitcher. 
and the Rays are tapping into this right now, man. Yeah, I'm beyond drunk on Ryan Pepiot. I'm blacked out right now. I rostered him. I drafted him in every fantasy league I'm in. Every fantasy league he's on my team. Yeah. He's the man. And he's, oh, I haven't been that good in fantasy, but he's he's like one of my only good players. But at number two, you already mentioned him, Shota Imanaga of the Chicago Cubs, his four-seam fastball. The lowest velocity on this list, but it doesn't matter. 92.3 miles an hour at 2,400 RPM. So it's the same as Brian Pepeo's fastball. 115 batting average against highest usage pitch on this list at 59.5%. He throws a fastball. So for every 10 pitches, six of them are a four seamer and opponents are hitting 115 against it. You know it's coming and you just can't touch it. Only allowed seven hits. And he's thrown it 241 times. Thankfully, I use game time and I'm going to go watch him tonight. So these stats may change. They probably won't change much because no team has proven that they can hit this four seam fastball. He's punched out 14 guys with it with a 21.4% whiff rate. He just hasn't thrown it as much as all the other guys. But in his starts, it's the highest usage pitch. So it's probably going to continue to be on this list because how do you adjust to it? How do you adjust? You go into an anti gravity chamber and practice hitting invisibles. What do you do? I don't know what you do. You take it. To ever hit that. And you know it's coming. You take it and you hope he starts walking, guys. Exactly. And that's why the splitter is so unconscious right now. It's because everybody's just sitting heater. They still can't touch the heater. And then they have no freaking shot against a splitter. Number one. I love that this is number one. Corbin Burns, the cutter. (laughs) For the Baltimore Orioles, the my favorite pitch ever, I think. Well, be, uh, beyond, uh, besides Mariano Rivera's bow is cutter. Yeah. But Corbin Burns' cutter is just the perfect pitch. I still have watched so many YouTube compilations of him on the Brewers with Omar Narvaez framing it. And it was just the most perfect pitch I've ever seen. And it's number one in Major League Baseball right now. He's throwing at 95 miles an hour. That's what he averages on it at 2750 RPM. It, that's what it's happens not, with cutters. They're higher spin. I know, but still. It's really good. It's still really good. 164 batting average against. He throws at 45% of the time. It's only allowed 11 hits. Now it doesn't have the same whiff rate, but you just can't touch it. And the reason it doesn't have a high whiff rate on it, he freezes you. He just freezes you. Guys are swinging at it because they think it's outside the zone and then it just dots the outside corner and Adley just puts the glove up. Nobody can touch Corbin Burns' cutter right now. Again, another pitcher who is going to pitch today as we're recording, so those stats will change. But to this point, those are the top five pitches in Major League Baseball. And number five, Luis Castillo's four-seamer. Tyler Glasnow's four-seamer comes in at number four. Then Ryan Pepio, four-seamer. Number two, Shota Imanaga's fastball. And number one, Orban Burns is cutter. Since the cutter became his go-to heater, because he, he was a four-seam guy when he when he first got up. And uh, he was the worst pitcher in baseball when he first came up. Yeah. When he leaned into the cutter full-time, when he pursued the cutter full-time, you want to call it post-COVID, like in 2020, like the cutter was skewed in 2020. Opponents hit a buck 62, like right, you know, he threw it what, 318 times? He's already thrown it 254 times. Like, we're pretty much there. Yeah. Uh, 2021, opponents hit the cutter at a 237 clip. 22, a 213 clip. That's when he won his Cy Young. 23, a 209 clip. So far this year, opponents are hitting 164 against his cutter. So this is the best version in terms of outgetting of the cutter that we've seen from a guy that has a Cy Young under his belt and looks like one of the best pitchers in baseball. Orioles fans are very spoiled. Good for you. Um, no, this is just, I mean, they're, they they're have putting it all together. Right on. You, yeah. you, were, no. you forget like two years ago, three years ago, we were like, this is the worst team ever. Yeah. I mean, they were, they were good, I think in 22. And then Adley? 20, yeah, I think they, they were in the, I think they were in 22, the 22, they were in the mix. 21, they were yeah. miserable. Yeah, they were terrible. Yeah, I think they were a 53-win team. But regardless, they're going to be spoiled for a very long time. And they deserve it. Orioles fans deserve this. Now you got Corbin Burns, number one pitch in Major League Baseball. So that'll do it for this episode of the Just Baseball Show. That's Zach McMullen. I'm Peter Apple. We'll be back on Friday, of course. But in the meantime, how about get yourself some Just Baseball merch? Go get yours in the episode description. We got tons of stuff. 
um, hats, T-shirts, polos, sweatshirts, bandanas for your dog. Just go check it out. Let us know what you like in the merch store. And if you don't like anything and you don't want to buy anything and you hate us, if you could leave a five-star review, we'd really, really appreciate it. Just five stars. Whether it be on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, your mouth just opened. Quick shout out to Matt Hilton. Do you know that name? I do not. Do you know the B guy in Arizona? Oh, his name is Matt Hilton. Tops just got a deal done with Matt Hilton, who exterminated these bees and threw out that electric first pitch. He's got a card now. He's got a one of one auto. The B guy from Arizona. That's electric. I love that. That's why my mouth opened. That's electric. All right. Well, there's some news for you as we go (laughs) to make sure to get the just baseball merch rate and review and subscribe on YouTube. It's the best way to support this show. We'll be back again on Friday for Jack McQuill and I'm Peter Apple. And with that, thank you everybody.